what you you refer to as a credit impulse yeah, in, the your, yeah. in your work. Uh, I've got to uh, dip my cap there to uh, Biggs, Maher and Peck, mm -hmm. who beat me to that one because I was a bit of a mathematical coward. I, uh, I knew that I had a relationship between the change in debt and the current level of economic activity and asset prices. And I knew that implied acceleration of debt would be related to change in economic activity and change in the direction of asset prices. But I was skeptical that economic data would actually support a correlation between a first order differential and a second order. So I didn't actually explore it. They beat me to it and they called it the credit impulse. And I've you know, since run with it, and I now call it the credit accelerator. Mm -hmm. I think that's a more genuine term because it really is, it's the acceleration of debt that drives change in economic activity. And that is partly an explanation for why the crises occur, why we first see them in financial markets before the real economy actually gets affected. And of course, it's a permanent thing. An impulse implies it comes in, it goes. Acceleration is always with you. So I prefer to call it the credit accelerator now. Or decelerator. How did it feel to come out with this 2005 statement, mm. first about Australia, then about the United States. How, do, what, what was the sociology of saying these things, putting this forward, broadcasting? How did other people treat you? Funnily enough, I have to thank Stephen Long. He actually claims he invented me. Good. Um, and we'll tip our hat to him. <laughs> yeah. So he was probably the leading one of a large number of journalists who really had that gut feeling that something big was building up out there both in the Australian market, but also what they could see with international news and so on. So I got a lot of journalists who were quite receptive to what I was saying. Then, of course, I came on the radar of conventional economists, and I was delighted. I wish I could find the quote where one neoclassical guy came out, and when he was told what my views were by the journalists interviewing, he said, well, I think Keane is in a minority of one. <laughs> but then I... Um, it was, it's, it's, so initially, positive response from the journalists wanting to hear me. They, they, news is partly about controversy. Then when I became publicly visible, I became what Australians call a tall poppy. And then I started getting the other economists having a go at me. Uh, and I then made the mistake of answering a question from an interviewer about what were the implications for house prices in Australia. And I said, well, in Japan, when their bubble economy burst back in 1990, house prices fell roughly 40% over the next 10 to 15 years. And I see no reason why we will avoid the same fate. Well, I just waved the red flag at the bulls of the property sector and they went for me like you wouldn't believe. So I found myself under attack from the property lobby. And if I thought I'd found viciousness in the academic sector, it had nothing on what the property lobby can do. So I, I really became very visible and very much under attack. And it has been hard. Uh, it's a personally difficult experience to be out there saying stuff which is contrary and which goes against what a lot of people hope will happen. Uh, it, it's personally difficult to continue doing that but I simply couldn't see how I was wrong on all this. And I thought, well, even given the criticism and so on, you've got to keep on going. I really feel for what Peter Schiff has been through, for example. Peter's very different economic analysis to me, but he was in the same situation in the States. I've seen him being you know, laughed at on, you know, on panels uh, with laughter of all people laughing at him. <laughs> you know? uh, so it is a personally hard thing to go through.